furious driving, proud to be supported by Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. And Lancaster Insurance cover the furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description Hello, below. Welcome to Furious Driving and today we're looking at back through time at some of the oldest and most important cars that's ever come out of British factories. Because yes, we're at Gaydon, the British Motor Heritage Trust Museum, to have a look around the collection. And as soon as you walk in the door, you find some of the oldest vehicles built in this country. First of all, one of the very first Rovers, an 1886 Starley Rover safety cycle. This is the first proper bicycle ever to be built. So first car or first vehicle with a Rover badge on it was a bike. And next to that, one of the earliest motor vehicles, an 1896 Wolseley, an auto car number one designed by Herbert Austin. So before he started his own company, he did this. And this is walking, literally walking through time as we go through into the museum. As we go past the brass age of a Daimler from 1897, which is absolutely fascinating in the difference between, well, the evolution of the vehicles. There's people really finding their feet trying to work out what did what and how to make these things go. Look at the size of that chain drive on that enormous hard rubber tired wooden spoked wheel. It's basically a horseless carriage in a very real respect. And moving forward a little bit, we come into the Model T. This is a 1912 car. This is the second oldest Ford built in Britain. Obviously they were built in America first and then Ford of Britain came over here and built them over here as well. I think in Liverpool as well as in Essex. Moving into MG's Vauxhalls. This is a Vauxhall OE Velox from 1926. At this point in time, Vauxhall was a rival to things like Bentley and Rolls-Royce. Many of course the bees here. This was money. This was actual money money. Think of the Prince Henry Vauxhalls, one of the fastest cars in the world at the time. There's some real significant stuff just in the entryway of the museum. This is 1948's first ever production Series 1 Land Rover, Huey 166. This is where it all began for Land Rover, an offshoot of the Rover company, and they realised how good the Jeep had been in the Second World War and how useful it would be for farmers. And another major, major milestone for the British motor industry, which kind of led the world in many ways at that time, 1959 Morris Mini Minor. This is the first Morris Mini Minor to come off the line. The first Mini was actually an Austin badged one, but this is the first Morris one. It's a Mark 1, so not massively dissimilar to my Mark 2, a few minor changes. And it's amazing to think that while that was going on at the Austins and the Mini Morrises, Rolls Royce, the other end of the British motoring spectrum, were churning out these things. This is a rather lovely gold over brown Rolls Royce. Silver Shadow from 1971. The Mark II Mini wasn't massively dissimilar to the Mark I, but this is a world apart. So moving to the museum, we have a taste of history. It's how someone's garage might have looked back in the early 30s, well, back in the 1930s. Slightly tidier than mine, to be honest. Now this part of the museum is almost my favourite because it's all the could have beens. It's my favourite and my least favourite because look at the stuff that didn't happen but so nearly did. Starting off with this, the Rover SD1 estate car, which prototyped, proved it worked. It looks a little ungainly, but just think how useful it would have been as a rival to things like the big Volvos. Rover just didn't do anything quite like it. It could have it's made, carved a whole new market for them. It's a 1976 prototype. 1952 A30 convertible. That looks so cute. That's the kind of thing that would have sold in droves, I'm absolutely sure. Like a little Fiat Gamine, but from Austin. Now, while the A30 would have been an interesting offshoot, this is something that really, really should have happened, but obviously didn't. This is the Mini 9X hatchback prototype. Isagonis himself 
felt that the Mini should have evolved into a hatchback car to progress things along and move things, yeah, he didn't want to be stuck in time. He wanted to keep on evolving and improving his idea. And this should have been well, really one of the very, very first hatchbacks in the world and certainly one of the first compact hatchbacks. So like the regular Mini, a very small car with lots of space inside, but so much more practical with this obviously hinged rear end. But sadly, it never made production. So 1969, the world could have been a very different place. It's a shame that British Lane's management were not as forward thinking as Uzigonis was. Now this, is, this though is very forward thinking, but it's just taken 50 or so years for the concept to reach fruition. This is a 1970 Crompton Leyland electric car, based on mini parts, style by Micheletti, but with electric power. I love the paint job as well. Real 1970s custom car going on there with this deep metal flake in the pale green and these amazing one-piece bucket seats in there. So this is a tiny, tiny urban runaround, basically, which is what electric cars kind of should have been a long time ago. Of course, back in 1970, the batteries weren't really anywhere near good enough. They're too heavy and too big for this kind of thing to really work commercially. Now this is another curious one, which is not really very well known. This is a 1969 Austin Zander, which is a concept styling thing. British Leyland, Austin Morris, set up a central styling studio to explore concept ideas. Headed by Roy Haynes with Harris Mann working with him to come up with just where the future could be, just crazy ideas that could just flesh out into, into machines. This was meant to have transverse power from a maxi engine. That's so cool, so futuristic in a very 1970s kind of way. It would have been great if this had happened, wouldn't it? Now this is something though that actually did happen, but not as intended. This is the 1955 Road Rover Series 1 prototype. The idea was that the Land Rover was very popular with farmers, but it was a bit too crude. So what if I took a Rover car and turned it into a kind of taller, more upright four wheel drive, go anywhere car based on a P4 and they planned four wheel drive for it. It's an idea that I can't ever see quite taking off that kind of car like go anywhere thing. Oh, unless of course you count the Range Rover, which came out 15 years later and then everything else for the last 10 years. But it is a real interesting design concept. A kind of go anywhere, do anything, extra practical family car, which is what the Range Rover ultimately was. Another, another could have been, but this one was far less successful because it was killed by internal infighting and pressure from above. This is a 1967 Rover slash Alvis P6BS mid-engined V8 powered sports car, powered by the Rover V8 and using an awful lot of P6 parts. It was badged as a Rover and thought of as a Rover, but there was probably going to be released as an Alvis. However, internal pressure that it was going to be a, too much of a competitor for the E-Type meant the project was killed. This was driven by journalists and they absolutely loved it. And come on, who isn't going to love a mid-engine V8 sports car? Which is curiously a three-seater. I've no idea if that would have made it to production or not. But what a great thing. Obviously the styling was never resolved. This is still prototype styling, but even there, it looks like something from a sci-fi program of the sixth. Now, floating back to all-wheel drive vehicles, we've got a couple here. We've got the 1947 Nuffield Gutty, which we'll come over to in a second. But first of all, 1960 Mini Twinimoke, which is a twin engine version giving all-wheel drive, instead of all the hassle and expense of running running gear down the center of the car from that front wheel drive platform, why not just put a second A-series in the back? I can't go wrong, can it? This would uh, be quite interesting. I'm imagining that when they got to uh, production, they would not have had two separate gear shifts. That would probably have been linked somehow. It was very much a proof of a concept idea thing which could have been quite interesting, but obviously never happened. This is the 47 Nuffield Gutty. This is a, a quarter ton military prototype, which obviously history tells us never made it through to production. 
I'm not quite sure all the knobbly things on the dashboard are particularly safe to be something in something that's going to be slashing around in the off-road world but I guess I thought it was a good idea at the time incredibly basic I'm guessing very easy to repair on the fly lots of go anywhere capability four-wheel drive knobbly tires very much in the World War II vernacular of styling there And finally around here, we have a 1969 Austin Ant, which was a 19, which sprung from a 1964 idea to create a more of a utility mini. So mini running gear, but in an open top pickup kind of concept idea. Again, obviously it never made production. Something Britain's done very well for a long time. They've been sports cars, but these are two that didn't quite make the cut. This is the coupe version of the TR7. I love the idea. It does look a little heavy in the rear in this particular concept version, but I'm sure they could have worked on that. And this son, though, is a 1966 Vauxhall XVR concept. Obviously, it didn't make production, but it looks like something from, I don't know, a, looks like something from a 1970s cartoon. It looks absolutely insane. Look how the doors would have opened. A complete center section gullwing. Very, very exciting. You can sort of see how the influence led into Vauxhall sports cars many years later. Even things like the um, VX220 have oh, a little nod to this. We do have a couple more exciting concepts on top as well. Here we have the 1985 MG XEE which doesn't look a million miles away from the XJ220. Although it's 1980s, the styling looks very, very futuristic and well ahead of other things that were coming out at that time. Very exciting looking concept idea. Bit of Corvette C4 in the front, cab forward, I'm guessing mid-engine idea. In front of which we've got a couple of uh, mini MG ideas, the ADO 70, which is kind of like a Targa topped two door shortened marina coupe almost. It looks almost Japanese in its concept styling. Very interesting. Obviously, didn't happen. And finally, we have the 1964 ADO 34, which rather than looking Japanese, looks French. Looks like a tiny little Peugeot. But what a cute little convertible that would be if only that had gone into production. That would be fabulous, wouldn't it? Styled in Italy, in Turin, apparently. You really can see that. It looks like one of the Pininfarina Peugeots. Now, something very exciting here at the museum are the Rover and BRM gas turbine powered cars. This is a little episode in Rover's history where they were really pushing the envelope of what was possible. But obviously didn't come to fruition now. However, there's a lot more to say about this that will turn up in a second video because there's so much more to talk about with these particular cars. This is a 1961 Austin built industrial gas turbine, which is similar in concept, if not in scale, to the ones that go into the Rover cars. So this is a Rover gas turbine, a Type 1560. Not quite sure which cars that would have gone into. But you can see how compact it is, how small. The unit itself was absolutely tiny. Obviously the uh, heat exchangers and so forth to make the thing work will have taken a lot more space. So although Jet One is the most famous one of these things, the P4 based convertible jet powered car, that was the first one that caught everyone's imagination. Rover kept on going for another 10 years or so after that, pushing the jet envelope. This is the T3, the third generation. This is the base unit test mule. Then we've got the T3, which is again kind of what well, it's bespoke basically. A lot of ideas for the 2000 went into that. Then we've got the T4, which is basically a Rover 2000. Then we've got the BRM, amazing cars here, really incredible. Speaking of incredible cars, a lot of Jaguars over here as well. C, D, X, K, E, all the letters. Now something that is quite remarkable 
and is, well, a bit forgotten today, is, well, not only were Jaguars always fast, luxurious sports cars, they've got a rich racing pedigree. Things like the C-Type, the D-Type, We've got the Jaguar XKE E-Type Group 44 racing car from 74. Broadspeed XJC, the V12 racing car. Can you imagine the fuel consumption on that? But this is something that was really, really massive in the 1980s. These sports cars here. When Jaguar went to Le Mans and they won in 1988. You don't really appreciate how big these things are until you get right up close to them. They are absolutely vast, but most of it is just aero. There's a huge engine in there, there's a cockpit for one driver, there's a fuel tank, and then there's just wheels and fins. These things really are quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. Kind of awe-inspiring, really. And of course, there's even the 2000 Jaguar R1 Eddie Irvine Formula One racing car. So that's kind of, that is that, without the bulk, if you, if you like. And this is a, a yet another could have been, potentially a Le Mans competitor, the XJ13, a car that never was. A delicious straight six in the middle of the car, simple cockpit, very 1950s, very flowing and beautiful. There's a few replicas of these which are actually road legal, I believe. Anyway, this is where we find the sheer variety of cars from the British motor industry over the last, well, 120 odd years. It's a small island, but with big ideas, you could say. So we've got everything from the very luxurious, but very low key Alvis to the uh, Austin 1100 parked next to it. This is just a real, slice of British life. This is a 1967 automatic 1100 with a Ford Angula. Ford Angula? Anglia. Its biggest rival, if you like, from the 60s. Very, very popular car. 1968 123E. More juxtapositions here. Tootling up behind the Alvis, we've got ourselves well, a Reliant van of some kind. What are we looking at? We've got a Reliant Regal Supervan 3, which is in non-authentic Royal Mail livery. Now here we have a Hillman Imp Super. We know all about these now, don't we? This is a 1969 Super Imp. We know how much fun they are. Another car which I'm sure had a famous owner, which I can't quite put my finger on, a Scimitar GTE. Sandwiched in between a couple of other quite interesting cars. A car which is now finally found its place as a classic. The Metro, it's the 1980 1.3 HLS, a real posh one. You see it's got the flush fitting headlamps on the front here. But really excitingly, it's got a, an orange interior, which is not a common option that I'm aware of. Silver car, orange interior. When this appeared in 1980, this was basically what the Mini X9 should have been 11 years before. Another family favorite. And we've got ourselves a 1982 Cortina. Two litre gear. Oh, I love the colour as well. You notice how the Focus was virtually the same colour 20 years later when it came out. Completely forgotten colour in the meantime, but came back. Now this, significantly, is a wedge, but it's a Wolseley wedge. A 2200. This is the very, very last Wolseley ever built. By this point, it was just badge engineering rather than a really a brand in its own right but still the most luxurious version of the wedges that were rolling out the production line, which of course also included the Austins. Look inside there, that fabulous brown velour with a metallic brown paint. What a thing, what a thing. There is an incredible amount to see. It's a, it's a timeline of motoring history. So we've got the MG on the left, we've got the 64 Viva on the right, the Viva looking very much more modern, but in a way less exciting with the squarer lines. What's that on? This is a ZB mag. This is a ZB magnet, and that's a Viva Deluxe. You can see the, the 60s influence of the fins, the jet age taking over there. Likewise on the Farina, but to a, to a lesser extent. And this is a really cool little thing. 
kind of style over substance in a way, the Nissan Duke of its day, the uh, Nash Metropolitan, except it's not a Nash in this country, it's an Austin Metropolitan, sold in America as the Nash, but designed very much for the American market. English in a slightly dowdy kind of way, this little standard family eight. Standards are always the, the less exciting versions. You look on this one, it doesn't even have a boot. It's just got a slot for your spare wheel in the back. Incredible. This is a quite a curious one. This is the Triumph Mayflower, a classic which has really kind of fallen by the wayside in terms of popularity, because it does have some slightly quirky styling. It looks like a bit like a Royal Limousine that's been shrunk to go on, uh, on a fairground ride in a way. Very curious little looking car. I joke about the Royal Connection. The body was actually built by Mulliners. It uses a pre-war standard 10 engine. However, the styling was not well received. More of a genuine Rolls-Royce Bentley rival. 1955 Armstrong Sidley 346 Sapphire. Look at this beautiful, beautiful thing. The only car with a Sphinx on the bonnet. Look at that. What a machine. And coming down to earth with a bump, <laughs> we have the Ford Anglia uh, previous generation, 19, 1949 version, next to a 1950 Rover P4 75 Cyclops. Interesting, that's 1949 from Ford, that's 1950 from Rover. Things are evolving very rapidly. And of course, we have got a Morris Minor. I think this is a low light, isn't it? Yes, it is. A low light Minor, one of the first. In fact, this is the first off the line, 1948, the very, very first Minor MM. So exciting when it came out, so futuristic. Ah, this is quite cool. 2017 Mini Cooper, Lego style. Now here we head back into the pre-war years, 37 Wolseley police car. Wolseys were always synonymous with the police up until about the 1960s when things like Rover and Ford really took over. That's some really quite rakish exciting looking cars. This is a 1936 MGSA. Big big fast machine. 1937 Vauxhall H type behind. Looking very actually really rather post-war in its style because it is a pre-war thing but Certainly into the late 40s, early 50s, a lot of late pre-war cars were pressed back into production. Well, I do love some pre-war stuff, so I'll turn around and look at the exciting Land Rovers in a second. 1933 Riley Kestrel. Again, fast, rapid, daring, dashing sports cars and a 34 standard 10 speed line. And check out these bonnet ornaments, these hood mascots, if you like. Great. Really very interesting, exciting personalizations you could do to your car. <clears throat> Moving into the MG Magnet from 1936 and a 32 Austin 12.6 Harley. Isn't that cool? Now this is kind of a curious looking thing. Those wheels are very unusual. Solid wheels in 1924. Leyland Trojan Tourer. Actually ran from 1913 until 1928. It was basically a utility vehicle. <laughs> it was incredibly cheap and sold under the slogan, can you afford to walk? In fact, it was so cheap though, and so cheaply made and to repair, some garages didn't like it and put up no Trojan signs. So you couldn't take your car to that garage. Here we have 1929 standard line. Although there are very distinct dis differences between these pre-war cars, to modern eyes they can be quite hard to differentiate, but there are big differences, things like the shape of the radiator cowling, the bonnet area, the doors, it's all differences, but it sometimes takes a bit of a, a knowing eye to spot the differences. Finally in this area, a 1932 Morris Cowley. Now let's look at some crazy Land Rover stuff. Now, some people gathered around the first Range Rover off the line over there. We'll come back to that in a second. This is an SAS style Pink Panther. Does it painted pink for desert work, believe it or not, because obviously deserts are pink, as we know. 
underneath here we have got a 1949 Series 1 80 inch, but quite an unusual station wagon. That high bubble top looking a little bit unusual just there for how we normally imagine Land Rovers. Now, this one is quite an unusual conversion. It's a, a tracked Land Rover based on a long wheelbase Series 2, so a 109 inch, but with uh, gun tractor type wheels on it with uh, geared wheels on the axles leading down to sprung twin wheel bogies underneath and actual metal metal treads. So this is quite a destructive thing to take anywhere other than off-road. Incredible ground clearance though and a power take-up on the back. And this is something I do absolutely love. I love one of these in my collection of many vehicles. This is a 101 forward control. So it's a Land Rover truck, basically. The V8 sitting between the passenger and the driver. Quite warm, terrible economy, but really go anywhere at all. And if you find one of the ambulance bodied ones, it makes a brilliant, literally go anywhere camper. Now this is the Range Rover Range Stormer concept from 2004. This is a really exciting concept, which ultimately I think became the Evoke. But you can see the real concept car interior with the, the bent curved wood, the brushed aluminium, lots of glass area. You can see why it absolutely took the world by storm. The Evoque didn't get the uh, Lamborghini style Cifadors, which this has got. Now this is quite an important car. This is the first ever Range Rover from 1969. Chassis number one, if you like. And it just showed what the Road Rover would ultimately become many years later. And you, this one you can see has got the rubber floors for a sort of wash down capability. It's got the vinyl seats. This is all the hard stuff to find if you're restoring a really early Range Rover. Wow, that's uh, a Donk Disc Defender. This is an SVX concept from 1999. Now we get into the Royal stuff. One's cars driven by the actual Royal family themselves or driven in in many cases. This is a 68 Vanden Pla, Vanden Plas. 4 litre limousine, which is interesting, but it's pretty much what you expect from the Royal Family. This is a bit more interesting, this is a very unusual customised Range Rover, so they can stand in the back while they're driven at one mile an hour. In fact, you've got the, in fact, there you go, you've got the 20 mile an hour only speedometer in the front so they could monitor their walking pace procession in there. Flagpole on the front, the maroon special for the Queen. 1974, 86 inch State 1 they called this one. Which replaced this car here, which again had the leather clad open area in the back for Queen and Prince Philip to stand in the back of. More standard in the front, but with very nice blue carpet, which the regular one wouldn't have had. Again, that kind of purple color and the flagpole. This car was known as State 4 apparently. This is a real treat. This is the Queen's own Rover P5. This is the car that she did actually drive around in herself. She did love her cars and enjoyed driving a lot apparently. And a P5B was one of her favourites by all accounts. And who can blame her? What a great car. Now, the British motor industry does also have a long and illustrious history of holding up traffic on holiday destination routes going back to, well, the 1930s, for example, with this 1935 Hutchings Royal Winchester Caravan, which looks like a mobile Edwardian tea room. Can you imagine how slowly this would be going in the 30s behind some kind of Austin? Here we get into the very early stuff, the brass era cars and Albion. Even remember the Albion brand? Not many people do, I imagine. This is a 1907 Austin, which is truck size, really, isn't it? Imagine piloting this thing with its virtually non-existent brakes. Okay, now we get into some motorsport stuff, which is quite cool. This one clearly has been on something of an adventure, as mapped out on its bonnet, starting from London to Egypt, Sudan, Kenya, North Rhodesia, Mashonaland, South Rhodesia. 
or skimming through here, Cape of Good Hope. And Natal, Tongaland, Zululand, Swaziland. So we go London, Cape Town to London. Going the long way around in what is a car not really practical for that kind of route. It is an Austin 20 from 1922. This was driven by Mr. Philby in 1932 on this insane route. 37,000 miles, apparently without incident. So here we have an A90 Papes Progress car. He was a journalist, an ex RF navigator, and was the first man to drive from North Cape, top of Norway, to Cape Town, bottom of Africa, in 1955. And he did it in this little car here. Austin 7 Downton. These are the performance modified minis. Look very much normal on the outside, apart from maybe a lack of hubcaps. But under the bonnet, heavily revised engine to get a lot more power out of that little A series. This one did 0 to 127 seconds. Let's skim through the TR7 rally car pop up headlights. I love the pop up, non pop up fog lights. I'm disappointed. Healy 3000 rally car, which apparently is the first 3000. Didn't know that was here. Now, this is an icon of the 1980s the 6R4 Metro mid engined, ridiculous power Group B rally car. Oh, it's rear engine, actually, I think it is. Just insane machines built to do just speeds that were not safe at all, which is why Group B was ultimately cancelled after one too many accidents. There's an MG speed trial cars here. This really is an astonishing collection of cars, everything from Austin 7s to land speed MGs. Really incredible. 1957 EX181 speed record car, reached 255 miles an hour. Moving up to one of the later ones, 1998 one, which went 255 plus, apparently. Wow. Now this, you might remember from the Judge Dredd movie. And it does look incredibly futuristic, something from space almost. But it's basically a Land Rover 101 with a unique body for the film. They built a few of them, and a few of them are still knocking around in fact. Well, obviously this one is, but actually on the road with real tyres on them, because obviously that's not a real tyre. Apparently they're a little bit claustrophobic to be in and very, very hard to see out. But aren't they cool? This is a city cab. Insert credit chip and dial your personal identification number. Speak clearly, state your name and destination area codes. Basically, it's like getting into a Tesla and tapping your credit card or your phone on the dashboard. But in something far cooler than a Tesla. Tesla. Here we have the Thunderbirds Fab One from the movie. Sat nav built into the steering wheel, obviously doesn't actually work. I love that wooden floor. As you can tell this is very, very early noughties, retro influence and things like the Mini and the Fiat 500 and the Beetle are all coming out. 2004 Fab One. Now we've got Tomb Raider Land Rover V8. This was actually a special edition you could buy, obviously without all the netting and stuff on the back of it, but there was a really cool Tomb Raider edition in this grey with a big cage and everything. Go for an absolute mint these days. They'd even have that plaque on the side. Now you might be wondering why an American car, the DeLorean, is here in a British car museum. But that is because this is built in Belfast. Huge government subsidy to get the thing off the ground. Unfortunately the government didn't come through with a second part of the subsidy and then the company folded and that was that. Really interesting, cool car, and obviously in uh, Back to the Future, three guys here, Mr. Fusion. And what museum could be complete without the Trotters Independent Trading Reliant Regal, which of course, all of them get painted that way. And this car, which we've actually sat in for the vi a video on this very channel. We've been in this car on a previous video. The Pratmobile, 1983, 1980, Mark III Capri. We head back to the uh, TV and film cars episode we did a while back. Now this is quite cool, this is a bit of automobilia, behind the scenes stuff. From in the factories, the prototypes, the cars are often, well always, but used to be built as models before they went into production and here we have actually got some surviving models. The Maestro, the Mini, 
Uh, is that the X19 again? X3, the X9, I should say. Oh, Range Rover, 69 Starling Buck. Even being built in a photo. Really fascinating stuff. You need to come to this museum and have a proper look around. It really is f just the best. Oh, Freelanders. MGF, I need an MGF. So much stuff, so much stuff. Accessories you could buy through the years. Now on the subject of styling bucks and could have beens, this was a styling buck for what would have been the next Rover 25 slash 45, which was so desperately needed. They call it the R30 internal code number. Obviously it wasn't gonna have suicide rear doors when it hit production, but this is very much the design styling was gonna go for the next generation of Rover family cars, which if you actually look at some of the uh, other designs and things which have now emerged really do look a lot like the one series BMW which followed shortly afterwards. Now this is quite cool, this is a car that's definitely on my list to own, 100 years of the Austin 7, in fact my son has given me instructions that we have to get an Austin 7 as one of our next cars or else in fact. And there are some really cool versions of this car because over the years it was in production. It was in production quite a long time. It evolved massively. 1923 Austin 7 Chummy just here into something quite a lot more advanced, gaining synchro mesh gearbox, better brakes, all kinds of body styles. I and mean, look at this one with an aerodynamic enclosed two seat, well, two door, four seater metal body. That's really rather nice. This is kind of what you imagine an Austin 7 to be more like. The open top, full length canopy kind of thing. Or the full length hard top, but very squared off. But don't forget, that running gear was so versatile. There were huge racing event series, series all about, about these because they're so easy to work on. Teams would have a boot full of gearboxes and a different gearbox for different ratios for each circuit and just pop it in. Super pretty. Awaiting restoration, but honestly, I think it'd be great to drive it just as it is. And you mustn't forget how influential the Austin 7 really was because it was one of the first cars with the standard pedal layout we have today, clutch, brake, accelerator. And it was sold and built on the license as a Nissan and a BMW. It's just an unbelievably influential car. In fact, this one is a BMW Dixie. This is the first ever BMW built under license from Austin. Now you generally see an MGV pretty much every day of the week, but not often quite like this. And when did I see a pink one with the blue interior? I think this was a, a motor show display stand from obviously when they were current. You do get to see exactly what goes on inside an MGB and how the whole thing fits together. So you head upstairs to the mezzanine and you find yourself in the Vauxhall section. Well, they've got everything from a very, very early Vauxhall to a very, very fast Vauxhall and everything in between. Even technically a Holden, but the VXR8 is still badged as a Vauxhall underneath the GM umbrella as Vauxhall was at this point. And this is an interesting car, which I've actually given a fair bit of thought to buying one for myself, to be honest, because I think they're quite a fascinating idea. It's an electric car, but a petrol range extender, which means that you do have a four-seater, which can do proper genuine mileage distances, but still do a fair bit of electric range as well. So you get something like 200 mpg if you're running on petrol, or about 50 miles of pure electric if you're going local. Sounds perfect, really, doesn't it? The only problem is that, uh, well, the boot is absolutely tiny, which is why I haven't got one. But yeah, the Ampera slash Chevy Cruze is a very interesting little car. Wow. Bedford Vans. During the war moment, Vauxhall got busy making stuff for the war effort. Tanks, trucks, fire engines, green goddesses. 
all kinds of stuff diverting from regular car production as all the British car manufacturers did. Here we have the heyday of the 50s, 60s, 70s. Even one of the coolest cars of the 90s, the Calibra. Mark 1 Cavalier, the Victor. This is from the days when they had really quite terrifying advertising with a guy dressed as a griffin leaping around trees. Or oh, better view the Land Rovers from up here. This Cresta is a very pretty car, isn't it? As is this rather nice wagon. This is an FB Victor Deluxe estate car. It must be a very rare car indeed these days. You see how heavily influenced they were by the American styling over at Vauxhall back in the 60s and 70s, and well in the 50s as well. Great way to see the Land Rover ramp from up here. But there is even more. Got the VX220, a Lotus Elise-based really cool sports car, basically an Elise but with luxury items that were stripped out of the Lotus. The Hot Astras from the uh, 80s and 90s, which were really were an icon to a generation. We've got the Chevettes and the HPs. So Vauxhall did have a great pedigree of making fast, fun cars. So yes, this has been a rapid walk around what is really an enormous museum of just everything of the British motor industry of, of years gone by because this country has produced some absolutely fantastic cars. Some of the best cars in the world, you might say. And here is a place we can come and find them. Some of the best cars in the world, you might say, but don't forget, we are still one of the biggest car manufacturing countries in Europe, so it hasn't all gone away. Don't forget the Mini, Land Rover, Rolls-Royce, all kinds of things are built here. Anyway, what you need to do now is like and subscribe to this video and get yourself up here to Gaiden and have a look at these cars for yourself because you cannot beat seeing them in the metal. I hope you've enjoyed this little look around the museum, a few of the highlights. If you have, like and subscribe, as I say. However, there is a second room, a second building, with all the stuff they couldn't fit in here because there's a lot crammed in here, but there's lots more they couldn't show. So part two of this video will be what's in the other shed over there. I'll see you again very soon.